Ron and I were talking to a man recently who said that today what used to be wrong is right and what used to be right is wrong. And I think he summed up the situation pretty good. But how do things get to be that way? How is it that things that were once said to be wrong are now right and things that were once said to be right are now wrong? We've talked about these issues before in different ways because it certainly is changing now. Everything you used to think was right is wrong now. And if you continue to say it's right, you're said to be mentally ill. That's how far things have gone today. So those are questions of morality and morality is concerned with what's right and wrong. There's different theories about morality one theory says morality is relative, and that means it's relative to the situation. And that means that what's right today in 21st century America may have been wrong back in 17th century America, that morality depends on the time and situation. That is the idea that morality is relative. There's another theory about morality that it's a personal thing. And what's right for you may not be right for me. And what's right for me may not be right for you. And so we just go with whatever we each think is right. That's the idea that morality is personal. And although you hear those theories discussed a lot, virtually no one believes them. Nobody believes that morality is relative. And nobody believes that morality is personal. You see, in contrast to the theory that morality is relative, most people believe that morality is absolute. And that is that what's right is right and wrong is wrong and it doesn't matter where you are or when you are. If it was wrong 2,000 years ago, it's still wrong today. If it's wrong today, it'll still be wrong 2,000 years ago. That's the idea that morality is absolute and never changes. Now in contrast to the theory that morality is personal, most people believe that morality is universal. That is, the same standards apply to everyone. Right and wrong are not a personal choice. They are the same for everyone. And so, despite how it may seem, there's general agreement in the world that morality is absolute and universal. And this includes both Christians and non-Christians, both Western society and non-Western society. That is, morality never changes, and the standards of morality are binding on all people, everywhere, at all times. So it's a puzzle then, if morality never changes, and no one really thinks morality is a personal decision, why is it that so much morality is changing today? You know, we live in a time when Christians are changing what they say is right and wrong, and they're changing it at such a dizzying pace that you can't really keep up with it. You've got to be watch, watch out what you say because something that was right today may be wrong tomorrow. So you never know what to say. So how can this happen if morality is absolute and universal? To understand that, I want us to consider how we know whether a particular thing is good or bad. How do you know morality in other words? And there's three basic positions on that in Christianity. The first two are very similar and related to each other. And the first two both tell us that God tells us what morality is. The first one says that God tells us through the Bible. That you can look in the Bible and know what is right and wrong. The Bible may not contain a statement about every possible situation you're in. For example, of course, the Bible doesn't mention abortion because it wasn't a factor in biblical times. But the idea is that you could get enough general principles out of the Bible to guide you to make the correct decision. And so a lot of Christians hold to that idea that God tells us in the Bible what's right and what's wrong. The second position is a little different. It says that God tells the church officials what's right and wrong, and then they tell the people. That's the Roman Catholic position on morality, that God tells the church officials 
and then the church officials tell us what's right and wrong, and it is increasingly more and more becoming the Protestant position in denominations like Episcopal, Presbyterian, Lutheran, and Methodist, denominations like that. God tells the church officials, and then they let us know what God has told them. And so in the past, those two positions were basically all there were in Christianity. The idea that God tells us either through the Bible or through the church officials in the late 1800s, though, a third option began to appear on the scene. And it started out very gradually, but by the 1900s, it began to gather steam. How do we know what's right and wrong? Today, this idea represents what most Christian leaders in Roman Catholic and mainline Protestant churches actually do believe and this idea is why Christianity is so rapidly rearranging its list of right and wrong. This idea began to develop when Christianity first began to confront the claims of science. Science had a different view of the world than the Bible and this eventually led to Christians today taking most everything the Bible says to be a myth, allegory, instead of being meant literally. And Christians did that not because they had any religious reason to, but they did that because they, Christianity in the modern world placed science at the top and made Christianity subservient to science. But you know, it wasn't only science that had such a destructive effect on Christianity in the modern world, there were other things that presented a challenge to Christianity. The major event in the history of this country in the 1800s was the Civil War and the movement to abolish slavery. Now, the main justification for the movement to abolish slavery was that slavery is immoral. The problem is, though, that from a Christian perspective, Slavery is not only accepted in the Bible, even by Jesus himself, but the Bible flatly states in more than one place that slaves are to be subject to their masters. So here you have society saying slavery is immoral, but the Bible not only accepts it, but it in fact indicates a move, that a movement to abolish slavery would be wrong because it says slaves be subject to your masters. So what in the world could Christians do? It was easy enough to take the creation of the world as allegory, and Noah's Ark as allegory, but you can't very well take that as allegory. So they tried something very creative. They said, well, you know, that word that says slaves in the Bible really doesn't mean slaves. It means beloved household servant. I've actually heard preachers preach sermons about that and believe it. There was a problem with that, though. The problem is that that Greek word that was translated as slave was used in all kinds of other Greek literature of the period outside the Bible, and it's very simple to go to that literature and see, well, the word really does mean slave. And so that idea wasn't very convincing, but even so, you'll still hear that sometimes used today. So they just sort of dropped that issue for a while, because another issue came up. And this one was an issue where the idea that the word really doesn't mean what it means couldn't be used. What came up was the movement for women's rights. It started in the 1900s with women winning the right to vote in 1920. And the idea of women's rights became more and more accepted in the United States. It too was seen as a moral issue much like slavery. And again, just like slavery, Christians were in a quandary because there are parts in the Bible that seem to relegate women to a secondary role. And you certainly couldn't get by with what they tried to do with slavery and say the word women in the Bible doesn't really mean women. So they found themselves in a bad position. Now, some Christians were content to stand on the sidelines and rail against how society was going against the Bible, but many Christians wanted to move with society and yet still be Christians. And that movement began especially in large urban areas like New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia. 
You had well-educated, wealthy people there who were leaders of society. They saw themselves as world-class people. They saw themselves as citizens of the world. And they wanted to be seen as sophisticated, intelligent, and worldly people. They wanted to be seen as the upper crust of the society of the world. And they, of all people, wanted to align themselves with the modern world. They didn't want to be seen like backwater heads. They wanted to be seen as sophisticated, worldly people on the cutting edge of everything. They wanted to be Christians, but yet at the time they wanted to go along with all these new movements. But they didn't know how they could do that. A man named Charles Darwin rescued them. And Charles Darwin didn't mean to rescue them. He didn't care much for Christians in the first place, obviously. But some Christians began to see in Darwin's theory of evolution a way to have both the Bible and also be a worldly, sophisticated citizen. You know, about 60 years before all this stuff started coming up, Darwin had published ideas about the origin of life on Earth. He believed that life as we know it developed over millions and millions and millions of years from a very simple point until it reached the point where it is today. And he believed that human beings developed from simpler creatures and evolved over millions of years to become what they are today. And as some of these upper echelon Christians back then began thinking about Darwin's ideas, they realized that they could resolve the conflict they were dealing with with these ideas. You see, they took Darwin's ideas about the evolution of life and applied that to society. And they came up with the idea that society evolved and developed over the ages. They applied Darwinism to society. And they looked at it in terms of the development of morality, the development of ideas of right and wrong. They looked back on societies of the past and saw them as primitive, undeveloped, and barbaric. They saw those societies as representing earlier stages of evolution. Just as Darwin said human life evolved over millions and millions of years, so they said that the concepts of morality evolved over millions and millions of years. Not that the concepts of morality had ever changed. They were universal and absolute all along. It's just that these primitive barbaric people were not evolved to the point where they could recognize what true morality was. But what had happened was that over the eons of time as society evolved, it had evolved into its final goal, the society of the 1920s. And that was the modern enlightened society. It had reached its zenith. Evolution had become complete and they represented the height of development, the completion of development. They believed that it took human beings many years, many eons to get to that point. And they lived at the first time in the world, the history of the world, that people had developed enough to recognize true morality. Now you see they looked at Jesus and they felt Jesus represented a quantum leap forward in the evolution of society, but Jesus appeared at the wrong time. He appeared too early. When society was still primitive and barbaric, he was so far ahead of his time that the people back then didn't have the capacity to understand what Jesus was trying to say. And then after Jesus died, all that was left to pass down the message of Jesus to us was these primitive barbaric people who were so undeveloped they didn't know what Jesus really taught. And so even when they wrote the New Testament, they phrased it in their own primitive and barbaric concepts of the world so that the true teachings of Jesus were basically lost to us. They were hidden underneath the pages of the New Testament because it was filled with primitive and barbaric understanding. The Bible itself seemed to be a product of primitive and barbaric people with an animalistic sense of morality. 
their idea became that the true teachings of Jesus, which represent a quantum leap in the development of humanity, must be separated out from the Bible, must be sifted out and filtered out and extracted some way from the Bible. They said that the things about slavery, the position of women, are these primitive, barbaric ideas that the Bible does contain a few germed cores of the teachings of Jesus, but you have to sift them all out. If you can apply correct biblical scholarship, you can glean from the New Testament a few things that somehow survive from the truth of Jesus. I remember back years ago when they had what was called the Jesus Seminar. This was back in the 90s, I think, maybe late 80s, and these people who fancied themselves biblical scholars would gather two or three times a year, and they would go over different parts of the Gospels, and they would vote on whether that was true thing from Jesus or stuff somebody had added, and they did it with little balls, you know, with different colored balls as to how sure they were and they voted based on the color. That used to be in the news occasion. People telling us what Jesus really didn't say. So they dismissed most of the Bible and most everything in it as the writings of primitive and barbaric people. You had to know what you were looking for in the teachings of Jesus to catch just a glimpse of it. And then they applied that to morality. They say, you know, you can't look to the Bible for morality because it's just primitive and barbaric. At the point there was written society was not developed enough to know true morality. Now, in the 1950s, this idea was really gaining steam within Christianity, and that is what began to be taught in seminaries. And it began to be held by the upper echelons in the mainline denomination. By the turn of the millennium in 2000, it was accepted by the upper echelons in virtually all major Protestant denominations and also by Roman Catholics. And you see, that's why it seems like Christians are changing their ideas about what's right and wrong, but they're really not changing them. According to them, we have just now reached the stage of societal development to where we can discern what true right and wrong really are. Moral absolutes have never changed. It's just that we're the first people in the history of the world that have ever been able to know what they are. And so all of the changing notions of right and wrong that we see in Christianity today aren't, try, aren't representing people trying to change right and wrong. It's people thinking that they're the first people in the history of the world that's ever discovered what true right and wrong are. Prior to now, no one realized what true right and wrong were because society had not evolved to the point to be able to know what true morality is. The idea is that those who came before us lived at a time when society was so <clears throat> primitive and barbaric that they had no hope of knowing what true morality is. But society has evolved until we are at its zenith, and now we know true morality on our own. And here's the really important part. With this idea, who tells us what morality is? We certainly can't turn to the Bible. Society tells us what morality is. Society tells us right and wrong. You see, because the belief is that with the evolution of society, society develops to the point where it will be able to discern right and wrong. Society is what uncovers true morality, and we look to the evolved society we live in today to tell us what's actually right and wrong. Who decides morality? Society does. It's not really that society decides it, but society is the one who tells us what's right and wrong. If you want to know what's right and wrong, there's no use looking at the Bible, because if you do, all you're going to get is a bunch of outdated, primitive, and barbaric things from the past. To know what is true, right, and wrong, you look to the evolved society we live in today. That is the current thinking in the age we live in within 
mainline Christianity, both Protestant and Roman Catholic. And I think it is an example of how Christians will always be at odds with society. Christians will never be able to go along with society because society always goes in opposite ways than Christianity. And that is something that the New Testament is very clear on. That is something the Old Testament was very clear on. When did the Old Testament society ever follow the ways of God? Never. And so the New Testament also tells us that society will never follow the ways of God either. In opposition to the idea that society gradually evolves into an entity that is able to discern true morality, the New Testament tells us that society will fall farther and farther away from God and society will always be at odds with Christianity. You see, society may come up with its list of right and wrong, but that will never reflect true right and wrong. What society comes up with will always lead us astray. And that's why the Bible tells us do not be conformed to the world. That's why the Bible tells us do not love the things of the world. That's why the Bible calls us out of the world. Jesus told his disciples, I have called you out of the world. You cannot be a Christian and follow the ways of the world. One thing the Bible is clear about is that. You cannot be a Christian and follow the ways of the world. So we can go our own way in our personal life as much as possible and let society go its own way. It seems like I've talked to more and more people today who are really concerned with the direction society is going in and they fret about it and worry about it and they let it bother them. And my advice is just this. Go your own way as much as possible and let it go. That's all you can do.